How's it going, everybody? Uh, I'm here with my really, really good friend, Art Thomas. Uh, he's a, a personal friend of mine and, uh, and a personal hero of mine. Uh, he's been all over the world and has seen God do some amazing miracles everywhere he's gone. And uh, so I want to ask you, Art, what's some of the craziest stuff you've seen God do? Ooh, um, well, one of the craziest ones, uh, a lot of folks have seen the YouTube video of, and that was uh, I was in Wichita, Kansas, and there was this guy, Carlos, who at, uh, I think, two or three years old, he was playing doctor with his sister. She stuck him in the ear with a hairpin. The doctors had to surgically remove his eardrum, and um, he had, uh, the, some of the story's not in that video, but he had had prayer through a phone ministry with someone else like a year before I got to him. And he started to have some kind of sensation in that ear, but still nothing had happened. And then uh, his friend, uh, Scott, brought him at this conference, brought him up to me and said, hey, my buddy's got hearing loss. Can you pray for that? I'm like, hearing loss, no problem. So I'm sticking my finger in his ear and ears open in Jesus' name. And before long, he's like, dude, I'm hearing stuff. And uh, the crazy thing, like I, I didn't know <laughs> but he had no eardrum. Yeah. Uh, maybe God put an eardrum in when the other person prayed. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I do know it's shake and bake, and I helped. I got to, I got to be some little piece of this. <laughs> right. Story. Yeah. Um, but that was pretty awesome. Uh, I remember also in Rattan, Oklahoma. I was at this church that uh, there was a woman there who was born deaf, and through her, uh, I think it was her cousin, some relative of hers, who was signing, interpreting for her. Uh, she said, "All I want is to hear my little boy laugh." She's got this little four-year-old, and I'm just like, oh, Jesus, I hope this works, you know? Wow, wow. And uh, so, you know, I just led this meeting. I've got everybody ministering to each other like I always do. Miracles are happening all over the room, but I'm, it's been a half hour, and I'm still with this woman, sticking my fingers in her ears, open up in Jesus' name, any change. And, you know, my, my wife's a sign language interpreter, so I know a little bit, so I'd be like, change? Yes? No? And she's right. like, no, sorry. I'm like, don't feel bad, you know? So, um... After about a half hour, all of a sudden she looks at her relative and goes, do I hear children over there? And her relative goes, yeah, yeah, there's there's kids playing in the back corner. And she, her eyes go like this, and then her little four-year-old boy runs up to her, like right then. And she picks him up, puts him on her lap, and goes like this and tickles him. And he laughs, and these tears just start going down her oh face. My and I was God. like, oh, oh, I love it. Praise yeah. God. Wow. Yeah. So so you said you started praying for her in a half hour later. Yeah, right. yeah. You saw your first signs of change. Yes, yes. A half hour later. And so what did as you're praying for her, what did your prayers sound like? What did what did that look like <laughs> for you? Well something I've learned is people are not going to be healed based on the quality or eloquence of my prayer. Mm -hmm. They're going to be healed because Jesus did what he did right. at the cross. That's so right. so I don't need to keep changing up my method yeah. as much as I do, I need to keep recalibrating to simple trust. Sure. So one of the things I often say is, you know, Romans 12, 2 says, don't conform any longer to the patterns of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. And one of the patterns of this world is if I try something and it doesn't work, I have to try harder. Yeah. So, you know, if I can't get the lid off the mayonnaise jar, I gotta put more leverage into it, beat it with a knife, run it underwater, whatever your grandmother told you to do, and uh, then it works. But the pattern of the kingdom is try less, trust more. Mm -hmm. And that's when I hand the mayonnaise jar to my wife and she opens it right away, right? <laughs> so it's like, if I am trying and trying and trying and nothing's happening, sometimes I do, I, I don't know if this is why Jesus did this, but when I read that story, I'm like, well, that's, that gives me something. Like there's this, this case, I forget which one it was, but he's ministering healing, might have been to the mute man, but it says he took a deep breath and let out a sigh. He's just like, <sighs> so I don't know if this is what Jesus was doing, but there have been many times I caught myself just like, take a breath, don't focus on the problem, just relax. This is not you. This is not right. your effort. Yeah. The Lord's going to do all the work. That's so important. I found when I'm praying for somebody and and the breakthrough isn't coming and you begin to uh, feel disappointment. Disappointment begins to settle in. You begin to f think through, okay, how am I going to graciously, <laughs> like, you oh, yeah. know, let this person down, you know? And so... 
it sounds to me like you don't you purposefully sort of avoid that whole <laughs> thing in in order to just say I'm going to try less and I'm going to trust the cross I'm going to trust what Jesus accomplished on the cross to do the work for me yeah. now so let's say you pray for somebody ha have you prayed for somebody and didn't see them healed before <laughs> all the time right yeah. <laughs> so, so what do you do in those cases what happens well uh, in some cases people die mm. you know and um, I, I believe personally that uh, everybody's a candidate for resurrection so I still try for that still haven't seen it happen but uh, I don't take death as the proof that God didn't want him healed. You know, that's sure, not necessarily sure. true. Right. Um, if people only died when it was their time to die, then Jesus wouldn't have raised the dead. So, right. And then he told his disciples to do the same things in the same breath as he said, heal the sick, Matthew 10, 8. Right. He, heal the sick, raise the dead. So, um, so sometimes they die, and sometimes you go to the funeral, and you grieve the loss, and you know, you walk away with more questions than answers. If you never want to have to face that heartache, all you have to do is never minister healing. Never try. Right? Sure, sure. Uh, but you're going to miss out on a whole lot of miracles. Right. So you kind of have to go into this thing with a little bit of thick skin saying, you know what, I don't have this figured out. Um, you know, Jesus Jesus had 100% results. Yeah. It just, it, when he tried, it worked. Yeah. Um, I don't. Yeah. Because I'm not him, but I'm learning to be like him. And so I kind of, I have to walk around with this hope that says, uh, as the body of Christ globally is maturing into the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, miracles are going to become more and more common and frequent. And, uh, and that's, if you mapped out miracles on the timeline of the last maybe 150 years, that's exactly what's been happening is this exponential explosion that's right, worldwide. That's right. Exactly so, right. so I'm, you know, in those moments where someone misses it, here's what I do. One of two things. Number one, when it's when I'm right in front of that person and it's something they can test then, and nothing happened as far as we can tell. I know there are people who will say you can't pray and nothing happened. Okay, I get it, but as far as we can tell, <laughs> nothing right. happened. Right? right? Let's just be real. Right. Um, I will look that person in the eye and I'll say, Hey, if Jesus laid hands on you right now you'd be doing cartwheels right now. Right. Instead, you got me. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning to be like him. That's right. And you keep going after this because I know Jesus wants it. That's right. That's, that's, that is so important to understand. Like, if, if Jesus himself were in your shoes praying for the person that you're praying for, there's no question yeah. that that person would be healed. Yeah. That means that it must always be the will of God. Yeah. It must be God's will for that person to, to be to be healed and, yeah. and rather than putting the responsibility on that person uh -huh. you're taking that on yourself to say look I'm growing into the image of God I'm growing yeah. in my faith that is so huge and I feel like you're leaving people with better theology to right. say God wants you healed and it's the church that's learning to minister well that's right instead of eh, it's a mystery for some reason maybe God's got some higher plan you know yeah and we just don't take responsibility right mm -hmm. So that's, that's if we can test it right now. What happens if the person dies? What happens if, you know, the miracle doesn't happen and you got to move on, you never find out if anything ever changes? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that really helps me is when I look through Scripture, you see a pattern that God loves to overcompensate for injustice. So, you know, the injustices that happened to Job. He was a righteous man. None of that was supposed to happen. Right. Um, but so that was not just that was uh, unjust. And then God gives Job double everything that was taken from him, and then 140 years of long life to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. That is an overcompensation for what he went through. That's right. Uh, the prophet Joel, uh, God speaks through him and says, "I'll restore the years the locust has eaten." Right. Which means not only does the famine end, but now you reap more than you can consume until you're paid back for everything you lost. Mm -hmm. Proverbs says a thief has to, if he's caught stealing, he has to repay seven times what he took. And of course, Jesus on the cross, right? I mean, one innocent, spotless God, God in the flesh, but human being, uh, pays the price for all humanity's sin, dies a criminal's death in our place, and, uh, and there's that uh, complete freedom available to all humanity, right. Though, right. to as yeah. many as would receive him. Mm -hmm. So, um, God loves to overcompensate for injustice. Right. So for me, if I try and it doesn't happen, 
I can still bank on the overcompensation of God. Right. That's like Jesus paid a high price for that person to be whole, and they're not whole, and that's an injustice. Right. Something's going to happen. And that's kind of my story. I mean, there was a, a husband and wife in my church, both diagnosed with cancer. The husband was healed, the wife wasn't. And all the questions surrounding that are what pushed me into a place of studying scripture, trying to be like, okay, I guess I don't have everything figured out. Right. And, uh, you know, three months later, I saw my first miracle. I was convinced God wants to heal. He wants to use every Christian to do it. And since that time, that was August 2009, and here we are just about uh, almost 10 years later. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I've seen thousands of miracles and trained tens of thousands of people to minister healing. Praise God. So that is, in my mind, an overcompensation for the injustice of my friend in my church dying of cancer. Wow. Uh, oh, wow. You know, I'm, I'm sure, I am absolutely certain the devil highly regrets getting that one by. <laughs> <laughs> so you got into this through these questions about mm -hmm. what is God's will to heal, and you came with the, the, the conclusion, it is always God's will to heal. Yeah. And so, how does that propel you? And I, I, <laughs> I know you well enough to yeah. know that you look at healing as part of the gospel. Yeah. And so, I, wa I want you to go into a little bit of detail and, and tell me, um, what is your motivation for the gospel? How do you preach the gospel? And what is what is the gospel to you? Oof, yeah, well, I hate admitting this, but I recognize I am not as compassionate a person as Jesus is. Like that is, that is one area where I'm still growing to be more like him. Sure. And so it's kind of, in some ways, ironic that I ended up in this healing ministry thing because, like, if left to my own devices, I'm the guy who's like, you got a headache? Everybody's got a headache. Go take an aspirin. You know, and get over it. Deal with it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the kind of before I got into healing ministry and all that, I got into falling in love with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's like if anybody you love pays an incredibly high price for something and isn't getting it, mm -hmm. you know, I, I make it something really trivial like, you know, your your father goes to Walmart and buys a big screen TV and that you know they never deliver it and they claim they did. Like, you're gonna be upset about that. Like, right. no. He paid for that. Right. You know, like if you're not gonna do something about it, I'm gonna do something about it, you know? And so there was this little bit of me that as soon as I saw healing was something in what we call the atonement, the yeah. the price Jesus paid, if you will. Uh, as soon as I saw that, I'm like he deserves this. I mean, I, I have people come up to me all the time at, at meetings. They're like, you know, we've had everybody ministering healing. A bunch of miracles happen. And there's people who nothing happened for them. And they come up to me at the end sometimes and they say, I just feel like I don't deserve to be healed. Yeah. And so I look them in the eye and I smile and I go, I have good news for you. You don't. Yeah. None of us do. If, right. if healing happens because we deserve it, none of those other miracles would have happened. <laughs> I guarantee they don't deserve That's it. Right. If we're going by what we deserve, it's death. So it's God's mercy that you're even breathing to tell me this concern. You know, right. um, this healing is not happening because we deserve it. It happens because Jesus deserves it. He paid for it. That's right. So that's that's to me my my chief motivation. Like he paid an incredibly high price, and I'm madly, wildly crazy in love with him. And like, how could I let that just go, right? Same thing goes with the salvation of souls and even more so, because it's like, you know, I can get a bunch of physical healings, but that's still temporary. Sure. Uh, that's the right. salvation of the spirit, the soul, that, that whole dynamic, the unseen part of the person, that's what goes on for eternity. So uh, we even have a, a kind of a higher call there. Uh, than anything else. So, I mean, the gospel in in its purest form, it's the good news of what Jesus accomplished for every single human being on the planet. Mm -hmm. With that said, I have to recognize Jesus said, I think it was in Matthew 24, he said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole earth and then the end will come. And so, it's a this gospel of the kingdom. Jesus hadn't died and risen again yet. Mm -hmm. So that, while that is an explanation of you know, what what, cul what the gospel culminates in, it's the climax of the gospel, it is what procures the gospel, 
Jesus was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom before that ever happened. That's right. And that good news was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means the rule and dominion and power and authority of God is present to transform your world. That's right. And, uh, and that's what Jesus brought to bear. He's like, if I drive out demons by the figure of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In, in Jesus' mind and, and in his teaching and his ministry, the kingdom was this very real, uh, present reality that was always within reach, that he brought to bear on people um, so that they could taste and see that the Lord is good. And of course, he says to his disciples, uh, one translation says the kingdom of heaven is among you. Another says the kingdom of heaven is within you. I like the within mentality because, I mean, if you think about it, kingdom, the king's domain, wherever his dominion is expressed, That's right. that is within me. If I've opened up my life to him, he has authority in my life. That's right. And so we bring the kingdom upon people through miracles and deliverance and the proclamation of the gospel and good deeds, you know, like feeding the hungry and, you know, taking care of the poor, whatever. We bring that kingdom to come on them. There's no poor people in heaven, so we give to the needy. Nobody's hungry in heaven. We feed the hungry. Nobody's sick in heaven. We heal the sick. Nobody's dead in heaven. We raise the dead. Right. Like this, yeah. is, this is what we do. This is the gospel of the kingdom. And then hopefully when they taste and see the Lord is good, they will welcome that rule and dominion of God's authority within right. them. That's and right. they become carriers taken into the ends of the earth as well. That's so good. So the connection between healing. Healing is the kingdom's effect upon you. Yeah. And then salvation is the kingdom's effect within you. I like that. Yeah. That's really powerful. So if you were to preach the gospel to somebody, yeah. um, uh, let's say I'm, I'm somebody who's lost and you yeah. were to preach the gospel to me, how would, you, how would you go about sharing the gospel with me? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's different from a stage than across a table or on a couch or something. Um, I think, unfortunately, the example most Christians have is stage evangelism. Yeah. So, you know, we watch some preacher on TV or on YouTube or whatever, and we're, we're kind of seeing the big casting of a big net, right? right? Yeah. And when you do that, there are things you say and ways you say them that work in that setting that don't work one-on-one. -on -one. Sure. So when I'm one-on-one, -on -one, I don't rely on those tools. So if yeah. you're one-on-one, -on -one, you're not going to ask me to like bow my head and raise my hand. <laughs> Come and forward. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Come to the yeah. Yeah. No, no I, what I'm more likely to do, in fact, I'm probably less likely to like preach a sermon. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless for some reason it just fits the moment. Uh, it's much more likely that I'm going to uh, ask questions and then story tell. Yeah. And by story, I don't mean make stuff up. I mean like, what is my story? Yeah. What is Jesus' story? Where do those stories intersect? Mm -hmm. um, one of the best tools I ever learned, uh, a friend of mine, Jonathan Ammon, who uh, you know, mm -hmm. he, um, he taught me this. It was, it's, I mean, it, it sounds like something that is, it's probably more general than Jonathan, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But it is simply a one minute testimony. Yeah. And that is to be able to encapsulate my life story with a gospel presentation within about one minute. Mm -hmm. So what I do uh, for my gospel presentation, my one minute presentation, I just say, you know, I was born and raised in a Christian home with wonderful godly parents who loved me and loved Jesus. And yet the best parents in the world can't protect you from everything. Sure. And so I was abused by some older boys in my neighborhood, which I'm sure you know what that means. Yeah. And um, that led me down a really dark path. I ended up addicted to looking at things I shouldn't. And I was an absolute emotional wreck. But then when I was about 17 years old, even though I loved Jesus through all that, I couldn't get free from those addictions. And then about 17 years old, that's when I had this revelation, like, wait, Romans 6 says that if we're united with Christ in his death, we're united with him in his resurrection. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ I no longer live, Christ lives in me, right? And I started to realize, wait a minute, all this time I've been coming to Jesus for forgiveness, but I've never come to him to die huh. and let his spirit come live inside of me and make me new. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I did that and I said, Holy Spirit, I need you to make me a born again person, like mm -hmm. a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. Right. And then live through me that new life everything changed. Now I'm traveling all, all over the world, seeing miracles, seeing salvations. Yeah. My whole life is different and I wouldn't trade it for anything. So for you, evangelism is 
this is what Jesus has done for me, and he can do it for you, too, if you yep. put your trust in him. Yep. Yeah, I tell people that often, you know, the best evangelistic tool you have is your testimony. Oh, yeah. Because your testimony is a case study in the gospel. Mm-hmm. It is... Uh, it, I can explain the ins and outs and the theology of the gospel to you, and yep. and I probably couldn't do that very well. Yep. But um, I can tell you what it does. Yep. Because I can tell you what it did in me, mm-hmm. and that is so so powerful. And and listen, if you're if you're watching this, I want to tell you, you have a testimony. You have something that God has done in your life. You have, you have something to share. If you've been saved, if you've been uh, born again, if God has done something in your life, you have a story to tell other people that will give them hope. You can preach the gospel too. You don't need a big stage. You don't need to be in Africa somewhere on some sort of rinky-dink platform with a, <laughs> with a microphone. If yep. you know people who are lost and you have a testimony, you have all the tools you need to preach the gospel. And, and you know, Jesus taught us to, to preach the gospel only one way. It was to preach the gospel and then confirm the gospel by healing the sick, raising yep. the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You know something, the, the power of God was never meant to be divorced from the message of God. Yep. You know, the, the power is for the proclaiming the message. Yep. And so I want to tell you, you have what it takes. If you have the Holy Spirit living within you, if you have the power of God living within you, you have what it takes. Yeah. You don't have to be Art. You don't have to be John Mark. You can be you, and God can take you, and He can use you to bring hope to people. You know, I, I hear lots of people say, well, my testimony is not as amazing as so-and-so's, whatever. Any portrait that Jesus paints is a masterpiece. So if that's true, you, like you're not allowed to be an art critic here. Like you, you don't get to say, Jesus, you did a better job on that one than that one. Everything Jesus does is perfect. That's right. So, that's right. Uh, just accept that he is God and he's really awesome. And whatever story he wrote in you is a masterpiece that is worth displaying. Praise God. Amen. Yeah. So uh, what kind of projects do you have coming up right now? Oh, goodness. Well, we're planting a church. That's yeah, that's be right. We're yeah. planting a church together. We've got some of that going on, and yeah. we've got um, you know a, a couple more movies coming out in the coming years here. We just finished Voice of God. Mm-hmm. We've got uh, more books that are coming out that uh, SupernaturalTruth.com is publishing other authors now. And uh, I've actually been working on other people's books so much, I haven't worked on any of my own lately. So uh, I'm kind of hoping to get those done quickly so I can get another one of mine out. Fantastic. But uh, yeah, God's doing good stuff. Awesome. So if you want to know more about what Art has going on, uh, you can check out SupernaturalTruth.com. You can check out some of his latest blogs. Um, I've got some material on there. Um, You can uh, check out, there's... Art has an amazing resource um, in the two documentaries that he's produced, uh, Paid in Full, which is a documentary on physical healing, which I've seen maybe five or six times, and every time I watch it, I just get fired up for healing. It, and uh, it's a documentary that it does more than just like, um, here's a bunch of cool miracles that have happened all over the world. You get to see some of those, but it is a teaching documentary. It teaches you how to minister healing uh, to the sick yourself. It, it is so, such a great resource. And another is Voice of God. Uh, and um, it, you know, I, I have to say, watching Voice of God, there's this moment. It's a two disc set. It, it, it focuses on God's voice to you and God's voice through you. And as I was watching uh, the first DVD, there, there's this section where art you asked um, who is jesus who is jesus and all of the interview subjects begin to launch into just praise to god and i i as i just began to um watch this i just like just brought to tears just just weeping i had to turn off the dvd and fall to my knees and just worship god i want to tell you something that that DVD will lead you into an encounter with God where you're not just learning about hearing God's voice. It takes you into an encounter of experiencing God's voice for yourself. And so Art has some amazing books. Um, 
uh, and some amazing stuff. Go to SupernaturalTruth.com and uh, check it out. Art, thank you so much for being with me. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Totally.